But many of you guys might believe. I don't believe that only Democrats pass bad legislation. We've, we've, we've messed up some things ourselves. We can expect in the future that more people will be carrying handguns. Figures. And this is something that we should celebrate, that today's gun owner is looking a little bit less like me and more like the rest of America. Conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. Run on arms. When it comes to arms sales and arm control, irony might not be the first word that comes to mind but it should be up there at the top of the list. For the past year, arm and ammunition sales have skyrocketed, fueled first by a global pandemic that raised fears of societal breakdown, then social unrest after George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, a contentious 2020 election, the January 6th insurrection in the nation's capital, and continuing concerns about another surge of COVID-19 cases, as well as President Joe Biden's talk about curtailing access to AR-15 and high-capacity mags contributed to an already tense atmosphere. The upshot? Americans literally cannot buy enough firearms and ammunition. It used to be that me, as a retailer, I could basically go shopping and pick and choose what I want to buy, said Clint Shepard, owner of Big Ivy Arms, which has an arm and gear shop in Mars Hill, a gear and ammo store in Candler, and an outdoor range in Burnsville. Today there is nothing to shop for. You wait on the phone calls from your sales rep and you take what they've got. So when Biden stepped into the fray April 8, announcing his plans to tighten restrictions on background checks, ghost arms and stabilizing braces that make it possible to shoulder high-powered pistols, local arm shop owners like Shepard found it ironic. Ultimately, all this does is actually generate more sales for more firearms to be on the marketplace, Shepard said. Criminals are going to be criminals, and bad people are going to find ways to do bad things, whether it's with a arm, a knife, a baseball bat, or a vehicle. Shepard said short-barreled rifles, similar to the Ruger AR-556 pistol, a man used to slay 10 people in a Boulder, Colorado grocery store, have not been big sellers in his store, anyway. The Ruger pistol the man used closely resembles an AR-15, uses the same ammunition, and has a 30-round mag, but it's shorter and technically sold as a pistol, which made its purchase easier in Colorado. In North Carolina, pistols are actually more difficult to buy from dealers, as they require a pistol purchase permit obtained from the county sheriff or a concealed carry permit, in addition to a background check. Long arms, including AR-15 rifles, require a background check. Everything just sold out. At the on-target arm shop and range in South Asheville, Co-owner Jeff Stucker said his arm sales have actually slowed in recent months. Once again, irony plays a role. It's slowed down a lot because I think people are getting tired of trying to find what they can't get, Stucker said, adding that both arms and ammunition have been scarce. Everybody has just bought out everything. Every time Biden opens his mouth, then we don't have anything. The run on arms and ammo at On Target started in February 2020. Stucker said they've seen all sorts of new buyers from all walks of life, including those concerned about civil unrest or even a potential civil war, and that includes people on the political left and right. On Target's overall handgun inventory has probably dropped by about 80% over the last year, according to Stucker. I probably only have about 10% of arms that are ours, Stucker said. Everything else is consignment. With some popular arms, such as the Glock 19, a 9mm handgun, Stucker will take orders from 20 customers and then call them when they come in. The arms don't even make it to the counters, Stucker said, very aggravating. Those Glocks sell in the $500 to $600 range. Ammunition Hoarding Acquiring ammunition has become even more difficult, sellers say, and when they do get it in, buyers tend to overbuy, worried that they won't be able to find it again. A lot of newbies have been buying arms and ammunition, said Russell Whitmire, manager of Lester Pawn and Arm in West Asheville. And instead of going in and buying one box of ammunition, they're buying five boxes. Just because if they use it up at target practice, they may not be able to find anybody with more to sell. The National Shooting Sports Foundation, the trade association for the firearm industry, said in a press release that nearly 5 million Americans purchased a firearm for the very first time in 2020. The NSSF surveyed firearm retailers which reported that 40% of sales were conducted to purchasers who have never previously owned a firearm. The NSSF tracks background checks based on the FBI's National Instant Background Check System, or NICS. 
NICS checks for January to July 2020 set a record at 12.1 million, NSSF said, noting that it is a 71.7% increase from January to July 2019. Conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. Of respect of her, the Second Amendment that took place. But many of you guys might believe. I don't believe that only Democrats pass bad legislation. We've, we've, we've messed up some things ourselves. High demand for arms and ammunition has not led to record sales, as sales initially soared last year. Before the pandemic, shooters shifted to 22 long rifle rounds for practice shooting, as it was plentiful and cheap. However, shortages have caused sales to plateau. Manufacturers have raised ammo prices by about 7% and distributors bump it up another 5% or so. Big Ivy Arms in Mars Hill has been able to keep a fair amount in stock over the past year, but prices have increased with the short supply. The demand for arms and ammunition has been ironic as shooters are reluctant to blow through much ammo on the practice range because it might be hard to replace. The limits on arm braces and ghost arms proposed by President Biden will not impact his business as he favors stricter rules on ghost arms and more stringent background checks for mental health. Ammunition prices have doubled or tripled in some cases, making it difficult to keep it in stock. At Big Ivy, the demand is expected to only grow, especially with talk of a fourth wave of COVID cases and continued edginess about arm control. Ammo prices skyrocket. Buckle up, ammo prices could get worse. Just when we thought that ammo supplies were stabilizing across the U.S., the Biden administration announced sanctions on Russia. This includes denial of all pending and future imports of Russian-made firearms and ammunition. A large percentage of the U.S. supply of consumer ammunition is from Russia, with estimates at 40% of ammo being Russian-made. The sanctions will further strain the availability of ammunition and will most likely cause price increases of all ammunition due to supply and demand. This ban will affect all calibers. June of 2021, you changed the department's asylum rules so that it could apply to individuals with significant gang violence. Most apparent here a defense of the Second Amendment, which this most certainly is. Twym says the Missouri law exposes people to greater harm by interfering with the federal government's ability to enforce firearms regulations. Additional Department of Commerce export restrictions on nuclear and missile-related goods and technology pursuant to the Export Control Reform Act of 2018. These sanctions also include a continuation of measures imposed on March 2, 2021, as well as in 2018 and 2019, in response to the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter, along with the waivers associated with these sanctions. For information about the waivers, please see 86 FR 14804 and 84 FR 44671. Duration and Conditions for Removal These latest sanctions on Russia pursuant to the CBW Act will take effect upon the publication of a Federal Register notice expected on September 7, 2021, and they will remain in place for a minimum of 12 months. The sanctions can only be lifted after a 12-month period if the executive branch determines and certifies to Congress that Russia has met several conditions described in the CBW Act, 22 U.S.C. 5605C, including 1. Providing reliable assurances that it will not use chemical weapons in violation of international law. 2. It is not making preparations to use chemical weapons in the future. 3. It is willing to allow international inspectors to verify those assurances. And 4. It is making restitution to Mr. Navalny. Actions under EOs 13382 and 14024 The Departments of State and the Treasury also designated numerous individuals and entities, including operatives involved in poisoning Mr. Navalny and entities that have developed Russia's chemical weapons capabilities. Together with the measures imposed under the CBW Act, these actions send a clear message that there will be accountability for the use of chemical weapons. The Department of State's actions under EO 14024. Pursuant to the authorities in EO 14024 of April 15, 2021, blocking property with respect to specified harmful foreign activities of the government of the Russian Federation, today the Department of State designated two Russian Ministry of Defense scientific institutes, the 27th Scientific Center and the 33rd Scientific Research and Testing Institute. Both entities are being redesignated 
pursuant to Section 1AI of EO 14024 because they have been determined to operate or have operated in the defense and related material sector of the Russian Federation economy. The Department of State previously designated both of these entities under EO 13382 of June 28, 2005, blocking property of weapons of mass destruction proliferators and their supporters. The 27th Scientific Center and the 33rd Scientific Research and Testing Institute have engaged in activities to develop Russia's chemical weapons capabilities, including technologies for delivering such weapons. The 33rd Scientific Research and Testing Institute stewards Russia's Shikani Chemical Proving Ground, where Russia conducts chemical weapons-related testing. The 27th Scientific Center has been involved with Russian chemical weapons research and testing activities. The Department of the Treasury's actions under EO 13382 and EO 14024. On March 2, 2021, the Department of State designated Russia's Federal Security Service pursuant to EO 13382 for its role in the Navalny poisoning and for possessing a Novichok chemical weapon. Today, pursuant to EO 13382, Treasury designated the FSB Criminalistics Institute, Vladimir Bogdanov, who is chief of the FSB's Special Technology Center, Stanislav Makshikov, who is reportedly an FSB official who was in frequent communication and coordination with FSB leadership and individuals involved in Navalny's poisoning around the time of the attack. Konstantin Kudryatsev, who is an FSB Criminalistics Institute operative, who is reported to have been a part of the core FSB group that was involved in Navalny's poisoning. Weapons ban is constitutional. So we know dangerous and unusual weapons are outside the scope altogether. Figures. And this is something that we should celebrate, that today's gun owner is looking a little bit less like me and more like the rest of America. Changed so significantly since 1791. So, yes, just a bit, right? So dangerous. Just a bit. Uphold and defend the Constitution, and he's calling me and my industry, which provides the law enforcement. It finds that reasoning persuasive, the things like analogies to uh, regulations of Bowie knives and Billy Clinton. Under EO 14024, Treasury also designated Kirill Vasiliev, who is the director of the FSB Criminalistics Institute. Vasiliev was in communication with FSB Criminalistics Institute Deputy Director Stanislav Makshikov, in the months preceding Navalny's poisoning, specifically during an incident believed to have been a previous poisoning attempt against Navalny. Additionally, Treasury also designated Artur Zhirov and the State Institute for Experimental Military Medicine, which is a scientific research organization specializing in security and defense that operates under the ultimate authority of the Russian Ministry of Defense, and which has collaborated with the 27th Scientific Center and the 33rd Scientific Research and Testing Institute. Zhirov is the former director of the 27th Scientific Center and a chemical weapons expert. Firearm industry reaches new peaks. President Joe Biden is stepping up his effort to cripple the firearm industry, the one industry that provides the means for law-abiding citizens to exercise their Second Amendment rights. President Biden's Commerce Department issued a new and unprecedented edict that bans the export of firearms ammunition, and certain accessories to most overseas markets. Are ones where, in fact, it's most likely that they should be bringing the highest and uh, mandatory minimum. The Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security posted a notice of a 90-day pause for the exports on a Friday afternoon on the frequently asked questions section that listed on the bottom of the BIS website. The Friday news dump was apparently an attempt to slip the kneecapping of the industry under the radar. However, this appears to be a coordinated event and more evidence of armed control groups steering domestic and foreign policy for the Biden administration. Earlier attacks President Biden's repulsion that Americans would actually choose to exercise their Second Amendment rights has long been clear. He labeled firearm manufacturers the enemy at the outset of his campaign for the White House. That's a purposeful choice of words. He didn't say the firearm industry opposed his policies, nor did he say it was an adversary. He chose to call the firearm industry the enemy, labeling it as an existential threat to the America he wanted to fashion during his administration. He's taken every opportunity to wage a campaign against the firearm industry and arm owners in general. He nominated David Chipman, an arm control lobbyist, to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, or the ATF. 
The ATF, of course, is the federal agency that regulates the firearm industry. His nomination was akin to putting the fox in charge of the hen house. NSSF opposed and his nomination was withdrawn. Director Steve Dettelbach was later nominated and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. There's also the ATF's zero tolerance policy that has seen federal firearms licenses revoked and businesses closed for minor clerical errors, even in cases that were addressed and closed. Some of those cases were reopened to revoke licenses and shut down businesses and livelihoods. As part of that pressure campaign, there's been a significant increase in the number of voluntary license surrenders by business owners who agreed to give up their licenses instead of fight the weight of the federal government over the onerous policy. President Biden has reached for nearly every lever of government to erect roadblocks to law-abiding citizens to exercise their Second Amendment rights and hobble the firearm industry's ability to meet the demands of arm owners. He issued final rules through the Department of Justice and ATF to attempt an end around Congress and redefined frames or receivers and ban stabilizing pistol braces. Might end up being a message amendment because the President of the United States will almost assuredly veto it. We can expect in the future that more people will be carrying handguns. Types of disputes that would be settled by people yelling at each other, maybe engaging in a fist fight, are being settled with guns. The frame or receiver rule outlawed the sale of unfinished firearm parts kits, and his stabilizing pistol brace rule redefined brace-equipped pistols as short-barreled rifles, requiring that they be registered as controlled items under the National Firearms Act requiring tax stamps and submission of fingerprints, photos, and redundant background checks. Both final rules are being challenged in the courts as unconstitutional. That's because they are. The final rules create criminal law without the consent and will of Congress. It is important to remember that only Congress can draft laws, especially those that involve criminal punishments. When an executive authority does that on their own, that's tantamount to tyranny. President Biden also took aim at arm owners and hunters by kowtowing to anti-hunting and anti-gun special interests to ban the use of traditional lead ammunition on national wildlife refuges. His administration hasn't done this just once, but twice, and just last week. These rules phase out the use of traditional lead ammunition and require more expensive and less available alternative ammunition. It was announced that it was to protect wildlife populations from the detrimental effects of the use of traditional ammunition. President Biden promised his administration would follow the science, except it isn't. There is no peer-reviewed, site-specific evidence to support the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service claims. They published the rules claiming to protect human health, California condors and American bald eagles. But the sites where they are banning the ammunition don't hold condor populations. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's research demonstrates there is no human risk from consuming game harvested using traditional ammunition. American bald eagles are thriving in large part because of the contributions paid by firearm and ammunition manufacturers through Pittman-Robertson excise taxes. That's benefited wildlife conservation to the tune of $25 billion since 1937 when adjusted for inflation. Latest Salvo now, the Biden administration slipped in this pause on firearm exports. That's significant for several reasons. First, President Biden campaigned on reversing the U.S. munitions list to commerce control list, export reforms that were begun under the Obama-Biden administration and completed by the Trump administration. Those reforms reduced regulatory costs and streamlined exports while strengthening end-to-end -end user checks to ensure firearm exports weren't being sent overseas to bad actors. Opponents of these reforms include disgraced U.S. Senator Bob Menendez, who coveted his Senate oversight role to bless or block any firearm exports under the old rules. It is now apparent why he so zealously wanted that oversight back. The longtime ally of President Biden was recently indicted on federal corruption and bribery charges that stem from him greasing the skids for small arms shipments to companies in Egypt. Because people buy hundreds of guns legally and then they sell them illegally. Details of the law, but folks, listen at home. Here's a quick summary of what this law is doing. It's already allowing. Are demonstrating that blind loyalty to Speaker Dade Phelan is more important than upholding their oath of office. 
The pause of firearm exports is unprecedented and the timing is suspect. The Biden administration's new Office of Gun Violence Protection, which is staffed by armed control lobbyists and activists, just concluded a roundtable meeting with Democratic lieutenant governors to explore new ways they could collaborate on more arm control. It is also in the wake of successive Bloomberg News features that called into question exports to foreign countries, falsely alleging that U.S. manufacturers are complicit in stoking crime. One was an attack on Sig Sauer over crime in Thailand, and a later article focused on Central and South America. Another attacked the Commerce Department's role in assisting U.S. manufacturers at NSSF's SHOT Show, held annually in Las Vegas. That's something the Commerce Department does for all industries. Bloomberg News is owned, of course, by Michael Bloomberg. He's the billionaire former New York City mayor who flamed out on his own attempt to occupy the Oval Office, ran an undercover sting to uncover illegal armed trafficking in other states without notifying the ATF or FBI that put the lives of federal agents in jeopardy and was subsequently chastised by his own police chief and the U.S. Department of Justice. He's also the financier of Every Town for Armed Safety and their mouthpiece, The Trace, the armed control group that now has office space in the White House, along with other armed control projects he funds, such as Moms Demand Action, Students Demand Action, and the Center for Armed Violence Solutions at Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health. When you pay that much money to fund armed control, universities name an entire school after you. During this so-called pause, the Commerce Department will conduct a policy review to determine if changes are warranted to advance U.S. national security and policy interests. Of course, this raises concerns that under the guise of human rights, the Biden administration will attempt to undo the USML CCL reforms, extend the pause indefinitely, impose unwarranted regulatory burdens to increase costs to exporters and close off overseas markets. Purely political. All firearm and ammunition exports are subject to defense and State Department review, which can halt the export if there are concerns. Firearm and ammunition license applications undergo a 100% end user check by the BIS Office of Export Enforcement, regardless of how long a company has been doing business with that customer. Regardless of how many times the buyer was subjected to an end user check, and regardless of whether BIS has no derogatory information on that customer, even if the end user was recently approved. At present, no other commodity is subject to the same 100% check. The kicker is that the White House has complete authority to regulate the export of firearms. That's what exposes this pause as nothing less than politically motivated. In July, the Biden administration sought to create a new division within BIS called Embargoes and Human Rights, with the assistance of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Commerce, Justice and Science, this division was stopped. It could be that this pause for a policy review is political payback. Everybody who follows this understands that the court is almost certain to strike this down. I want to be clear, this wasn't based on violence. This is ba based on threats specifically to individuals, on gangs. Defense not just as might seem most apparent here, a defense of the Second Amendment, which this most certainly is. There is no right to export, and the decision to grant or deny a license is purely a function of the national security and foreign policy assessment of those in charge. The USML CCL reforms give the administration complete and essential unfettered discretion. BIS invoked national security and foreign affairs as the reason for the pause. Congressional reaction comes through the power of the purse. Congress can, and must, act through appropriations to ensure that the Biden administration is held accountable for its attempt to kneecap the industry through their unprecedented export pause. This is a naked attempt to hobble the firearm industry, which President Biden made clear that he despises. It is also a shameless favor to the armed control special interest groups that have bought their way into the White House that are now using foreign policy to exert their influence over domestic policy. The American firearm industry has been called the arsenal of democracy because a strong and robust small arms manufacturing base has armed and equipped our law enforcement at home and our military and allies abroad. 
President Biden's pause is an attempt to weaken that arsenal and diminish the industry that provides the means for Americans to exercise their Second Amendment rights. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.